different voices, diverse viewpoints, shared space, and visible diversity. How lovely to be back at InspireFest this morning. But when you take stock in the real world, there are just too many situations where sharing and diversity do not mean what they say. Women make up just over half the world's population. And yet, in Ireland today, men make up 78% of our national parliament, 73% of senior cabinet positions, 87% of the boards of PLCs, 72% of the voices heard in news and current affairs radio broadcasting. And it's not just Ireland. Men make up 76% of the people heard, seen, and read about in newspapers, on television, and in radio news. That's across 114 countries, and is exactly the same as five years ago. Across Fortune 500 companies, 94% of CEOs are men and the share of women appointed to those boards actually declined last year. Now, we know that peace talks are more successful when women participate, but 91% of peace negotiators are men. And photos often tell their own story. In the photos from the G20 summit last September, 89% were men. At the NATO summit in Brussels, official photos had 86% men. And when you search for the terms managing director online, this is what you see. Now, who would sign up to this in the 21st century? And yet here we are, excluding explicitly or implicitly half of the population. And we become so used to seeing inequality, we don't see it. Diversity does mean much more than gender, but gender still often determines so much of how we experience the world, how we talk, how we talk in same or mixed sex company, how we experience childhood and education, health, social services, but also career, parenthood, age. The logic isn't complicated. Without gender diversity, inclusive solutions are impossible. I've talked to many people about gender equality, and sometimes the language itself becomes awkward, even divisive. People will balk at quotas or even targets. They worry about meritocracy, as if the current inequality is a reflection only of the greater merit of men. They may worry about disenfranchising men, as though the current inequality doesn't disenfranchise women. And they may worry that somebody will think they're a token woman. It can feel sometimes like we want to fix the inequality, but without actually changing anything. Now, at Accenture, we think it is time to disrupt things, to create a more inclusive future. We're committed to a 50-50 workforce worldwide by 2025. Diversity. Diversity is a source of innovation and creativity and also competitive advantage. And the prize of equality is a better workplace, but also a more inclusive society and a truly human environment where people of all genders belong. Now, in matters of equality, Ireland actually got off to a great start. The 1916 proclamation was a radical endorsement of equal rights and explicitly addressed women and men equally. In fact, 99 years ago, while other nations were still campaigning to secure voting rights for women, Irish woman Constance Markiewicz became the first woman in history to be elected to the British House of Commons for the Dublin St. Patrick's constituency, where I was born a half a century later. And with the establishment of the first Dáil Éireann in the Irish Parliament, she would be one of the first women anywhere in the world to hold a cabinet position. However, it was 60 years before a second woman held a cabinet position in the Free State. And it was in that gap that new legislation took back that promise of equality. Women were removed from juries, although they had been judges during the War, during the war of Independence. Quotas were introduced to limit the number of women in many industries and to bar them altogether from some. Women were paid on a lower salary scale than men for the very same work, and they were routinely forced to leave their jobs if they got married. And the constitutional assurance of equality without distinction of sex was removed in the Constitution in 1937. And at the stroke of a pen, women's citizenship was now defined in terms of their roles as wives and as mothers. And to put that in context, my mother's mother got married at 19. By 1937, she was 32. 
and she'd already given birth to seven of her children in crowded conditions in Dublin's liberties. So the day-to-day -day reality of life meant that the definition of gender in the Constitution was not a priority for her. And this is aptly depicted in this cartoon from the archives of Dublin Opinion, published exactly 80 years ago uh, this month. Will you shut up all years while your father's explaining me position under the new constitution? And the real irony is Nana Griffin probably wouldn't have had access to newspapers or to any media. Women were typically talked to. Uh, mass communication was literally the mass, and there were three beautiful and majestic churches in the small area where she lived. But the vast majority of women were not in the communication network in any sense. So I guess the importance of the Irish case study is that much can be lost at the stroke of a pen, and we are still dealing with the legacy of that 1937 thinking today. The inclusiveness that was imagined by women and men 100 years ago was erased 21 years later, when women were made invisible in much of public life. And visibility really matters. In 1990, I can still remember the feeling I had when I heard the President of Ireland addressing the nation and calling out for the first time in history, women of Ireland, not as other, but as self. And as a young woman listening to Mary Robinson gave her inaugural speech 27 years ago, I can remember that jolt of inclusion, of being newly admitted to this public space, although I hadn't realized I'd felt excluded. More women joined the workforce in Ireland in the five years that followed that address than in the previous 20 combined, and I was one of them. Over a 10-year period, the number of working mothers doubled, and children born to those working mothers have now come of age. My daughter is one of them. And yet, in the telling of the past, women's histories are still often excluded. And each generation of women thinks it must begin again because of invisibility of women in our past. We become so used to seeing inequality, we don't see it. Pictures are an important part of how we create memories and pass stories on to future generations. So if we leave women out of public portraits, they are less visible, but also their work is less known for future generations and less valued. Their legacy disappears with them. At InspireFest Fringe last year, we profiled the Accenture Women on Walls partnership with the Royal Irish Academy that Anne alluded to, to commission portraits of the first four women members of the Academy, and also a group portrait of eight uh, contemporary scientists representing women working in Ireland today. And those paintings were unveiled in December, and there are now women on walls at Academy House for the first time in their 230 year history. It is good that they, that they get acknowledgement and they, they get it publicly. I'm just thinking of my two daughters, you know, it's good for them to know that people get recognised for their achievements and women get recognised for their achievements and that they can, uh, can do physics or, you know, God knows what and uh, they will get recognition for it. Would have been nice to do them from life or at least meet them before. At a major cultural change from, say, 1900 or 1916. In 1916, women did not even have the vote at that stage. So it's taken us 100 years to get this far. It's not far enough, but it is the middle of a, a huge revolution in society. So that's what, what we're recording here, really. I think what's been really heartening about the Women on Walls project was the way so many people of all ages, of all genders, and across multiple and diverse sectors really engaged with the project. I think we're at a really pivotal point for change. We're seeing how social media and new technologies can give voice to those who are underrepresented in traditional media or hierarchies. Social media makes the personal political like never before in history and it changes the space in which these discussions can take place. From the hashtag activism of all male panels to fearless girl, from waking the feminists to I look like an engineer. New technology is enabling groups to communicate, to collaborate, and to organize across boundaries of space and time. And one great example of radical social change achieved through very human storytelling, but amplified by technology, 
was the campaign for marriage equality in Ireland. As you know, two years ago, Ireland became the first country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage by popular vote. Votes in favor of the proposal, 1,201,607. so strongly for this and what does it mean? I felt our family wasn't recognised as being a family. It is now and I can't thank the people of Ireland enough for what they did last Friday. You know, I've watched that video with countless people from all over the world and each time I really feel that moment again when people of all genders came out to vote, many came home to vote, and proved that love wins. We really owe all those who campaigned our national gratitude and respect for showing how change can happen through speaking up and sharing stories. And 100 years after the proclamation, our republic again saw women and men work together to create a more inclusive future. Is it crazy to imagine doing the same thing for gender equality? But if the last year has taught us anything, we cannot be complacent. Change can happen very quickly, but progress is not inevitable when it comes to equality, belonging and inclusion. We need to think critically and act ethically in times of change. Inclusion starts with I.